Welcome back to a brand new episode, an enthralling episode, and invigorating. So we've done two takes now, and Budim said enthralling in both takes of the intro. Um, well, you had a problem with invigorating. You were cool with enthralling. Oh, true, 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 true. You're right. You're put, right. Some res- put some respect on enthralling's name. Welcome back to an enthralling episode. Right? <laughs> but this, but this episode actually like was low-key enthralling. Like It was. We had on... Jonathan Wasserman of Bleacher Report fame. The draft, draft guru. Jeff Guru, if you will. We, the Wasp Boss, known in draft circles. A draft what? guru. We called him a draft guru. In the I called him draft guru. I mean, we're about, we're about to get to the soda where I literally will, like, in one minute, call him the draft guru. Um, I would say he is. I mean, I don't... I think I don't the only thing we need to address, uh, besides getting straight into the episode, is your last night Twitter encounter with Sam Decker... Um, which resulted in him leaving the platform, um, which is a Budim special, actually. I'm pretty. You had who else have I removed from a Twitter? I don't think I've deactivated in and off a platform. No, you didn't deactivate. But there was there was the Cole Ald- like this. This rings a little clear. This is like the Cole Aldrich beef with racial undertones. I think this is like the. I guess. I mean, I'd be trolling. I don't normally like troll someone off a platform. So to be fair, you came back. So anyway, to preface this, Sam Decker was beefing. Well, not Sam back Decker. Like J.R. Smith was like, I only had one bad teammate in my career, Sam Decker, because he was talking Trump shit. And then Sam Decker, because he's like in Turkey for the Super Turkey Telecom League right now. <laughs> like he didn't respond to it till like 1 a.m. last night. And no one was awake. And except for me for no reason. Or like it was like two a.m. Maybe it was, it was late, but it was like probably a normal time in Turkey. And he was like, he just gave like an apology, being like, "I'm no MAGA guy." Like, it's that's a load of baloney. And then I remembered, like, wait a minute, I feel like I remember some Sam Decker definitely a little MAGA, and it had more to do with him just like looking exactly like Charlie Kirk, and like see, well, think he's MAGA. Was, like, there was there was that sneaky tweet he had? Like that was well, real. yeah. I mean, I don't know if it was. Honestly, if you're being real, like, it probably wasn't that bad, but just, like, it, I mean, it was still, like, being weird with, like, you know, you could be proud to be white. I don't know. You just what don't, that, you don't really need cool. white pride tweets in 2020, you man. You really just don't. Just and don't. I linked that, and, like, he immediately hit it and blocked me, and then shortly after, deactivated his account as a whole. He actually reactivated today, but that apology tweet is gone he just realized like it was not it was not worth the fight but i think i was the catalyst of okay. linking that tweet and like it's not even me like because of course like immediately i mean it wasn't too many because like again it was at 2 a.m and it was like immediately deleted but like of course i had like trump supporters being like oh what do you say that was so bad like you know you're just being biased this was an article posted by the new york post and the new york post is being like you're making controversial white pride tweets you're making yeah. controversial white pride speeches because the New York, the New York Post would love to be like, oh, paper that it's has like, unequivocally um, endorsed. Produce nothing good besides Mark Berman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They just endorsed Trump. Like, believe me, Trump. believe me. If they wanted, like, if they thought it was worthy of like taking offense to even a little bit, they wouldn't have said Sam Decker publishes this controversial white pride tweet they'd be like sam decker is like now, killed for saying the worst for saying like something innocent you know well, like if the new york post is calling you out it's worth calling just, out just to add on to add some closure to the interaction today with sam decker's wife clapping back at jr um then they i didn't see that you didn't see that so basically with olivia decker calling jr a liar and then jr clapping back at olivia decker and then olivia decker being like consider the source, this is inaccurate and unfair. And JR is being like, explain to your husband why he can't say the N-word. God damn. I mean, I don't know, man. I, like, maybe he's not necessarily a MAGA guy, but I feel well, like... I don't, I'm just saying... I, that, think, I think I buy... Well, I, here's the thing. that We don't even need to continue this conversation because, first of all, it's Sam Decker and he doesn't deserve this much airspace. Okay? Yeah, it's enough and, airspace for Sam Decker and, for the next, like, three all, decades. Uh, and second of all, um, I J.R. Smith has had enough teammates in his life and uh, been teammates with enough different type of people. If Sam Decker's the one person in his entire career that he hates, you know what? I, I, I hate Sam Decker too, and all my homies hate Sam Decker. 
Um, we all hate Sam Decker here at the Pro 36 podcast. <laughs> um, exactly. Well, no, I'm just saying, like, he, he didn't say, like, he didn't say necessarily he was MAGA. He was saying MAGA shit and, like, dude, white, yeah. pr- you know, making white pride yeah. tweets. Yeah. I would yeah. say that constitutes MAGA shit, you know, if not necessarily being, like, go Trump. It's like, you know, a little, I'm sure Sam Decker was making, like, a bunch of weird questions out of us, which is what he was saying. Like, he probably wasn't being, like, oh, why do you hate Trump? He's probably just saying, like, a bunch of, like, weird, weird stuff that put people the wrong way, which I, I buy. Um, and now Sam Decker goes bye-bye at the turkey because he is not, they, like, I don't think anyone's, I don't think anyone was planning on giving Sam Decker a flyer anyway, but, like, I, I, like, I well, think they're, like, a little. I think we should wrap up, up the, De- I think we should wrap up the Sam Decker. It's enough Sam Decker time. But anyway. And I think we should just introduce. I would say we talked about this after this was probably in terms of um, I'm a, I love the draft and I love um, reading Jonathan Washerman's um, reports and his big words and his mocks. And so this was me and you talked about this. This was definitely, this was probably, this was one of our favorite episodes just in terms of um, kind of the in-depth uh, talk we got. That's, that's different than just reading a mock draft. Yeah. If you like the draft, you're interested in the draft. This is the episode for you. We kind of just like go through all the prospects we care about and some of the ones we don't. And I feel like it was pretty, it was pretty entertaining, pretty enthralling, pretty invigorating. Um, and with that being said, let's get into it and uh, see which wait, prospects also, are going to be Sam Decker wait, and which aren't. I got Welcome back, everyone, to a very special episode of the Per 36 podcast today to discuss the draft and whatnot, because the draft is coming up soon in November, uh, yeah. as it typically does these days. Um, we have Bleach Reports Draft Guru, I'd say, as a, you told me if that's not a good title, uh, Jonathan Wasserman. Jonathan, thanks for coming on. Yep. What's up, guys? Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, especially, I, I, this is definitely, I mean, it, I, it's gonna, probably going to start getting crazy busy for you. Um, so happy that we could get in right before the, the final kind of push. Yeah, so, this is uh, this is a big a big couple of weeks coming up. Well, first off, um, what have you kind of noticed um, with this being always? I mean, you're very draft centric. What have you noticed about um, kind of this year's cycle being super different? Besides uh, all the work being remote. Um, has it been different in terms of what you've been hearing from teams um, about the whole process? Yeah, it feels like there's a lot more going out of your way to collect and trade information because it's tougher to get it. And so like, I, I have like six conversations going on right now with like six different teams all trying to hear what everyone else is thinking. And it's usually like that, but not to the day it is this year. Like everybody just – Nobody really knows what's going on. It's harder to get face time with guys. And, um, and agents have a little bit more control of controlling, you know, where their guys are going to go and who's going to see them. And so I think that's probably the biggest difference this year is like how crazy teams are with going out and trying to find information. So draft schmucks like us, we could riff on the draft all we want, but how did you get to the point where you're not only just writing about it for Bleach Report, but you're actually in conversations with, NBA teams how did you and you are a definite authority figure um in terms of the analysis I mean (laughs) everyone's going to be wrong and everyone's going to have their misses but you are definitely like uh one of you and Kevin O'Connor I the the two first names I think of when it comes to who people look for um, I appreciate that um yeah so I mean like I'll admit I it, it took a little bit of luck and I got into this when like people started blogging like when that like took off. I graduated from Syracuse in 2008 and like, you know, right away, it's just as a hobby. You know, I, I wrote for NBA draft.net. Like that was a company. They were like the first guys to do mock drafts. And so I always read them growing up and I found a way in to, to write for them for, you know, little to no money. And I did that for three years. And then I got lucky and Bleacher Report called me after like three years of reading my stuff. And so that was in 2012, I think. Um, the Anthony Bennett year of the draft. That was my first year at Bleacher Report. And so, you know, after... Where'd you have Anthony Bennett? <laughs> I think I had him seven or eight. Uh, okay. I mean, that was a that shitty one, draft. That, that was like... Fair, you know, that, was, that was his level. You know, was draft. I mean, it was, it was similar to this year where nobody knew who was going to go first. And like whoever they said was probably going to be like, you know, like 
really? It, Anthony Bennett was not a name with anyone. Anyway, drifting here, but but yeah. So I don't know. After I don't know. I forget what is this? My eighth season or something like that. You know, you make a lot of new connections. You go to all these scouting events and stuff, and uh, and you know, fast forward years in 2020, and I've made a lot of good contacts, and it's been a fun ride so far. Um, just what it's talking about Anthony Bennett. Simon and I were like going through like drafts last night and just like we did a deep dive on the on david Kahn's draft yeah we were looking at david we were, we were <laughs> looking at daryl morey we were looking at david Kahn. definitely a different dichotomy there the daryl morey's not really a guy you think of as like a good drafter but like he, he pretty much well i guess we'll talk about his one his one miss but he's, he's been pretty he's been pretty spot on in the time spots we've had but then we went on to uh david Kahn, which is the opposite it looks impressively bad like because, like, even when he got lucky and, like, traded Al Jefferson for two firsts, like, he somehow turned those two firsts, like, and even to bust into nothing. But whatever, not to get off track. Yeah, but, but it's just, not David's podcast. Yeah, just uh, – but anyway, looking at the drafts, I just feel like some of it was just, like, you looking back, some of it is, like, kind of comically funny. Do you think that that's always – like, the, do, do you think, like, the that – Teams have gotten smarter with drafting yep. at all, or mm-hmm. that's pure losing you again, dude. Dude, uh, what? You can't hear me right now. It's gonna come back, and it's gonna be where did I lose? It's just gonna. I, I can hear you guys. Freeze right and pop yeah. back to life. Literally, I, I can hear you guys right now. He does. Okay, yeah. Boom. And he's back, dude. I, I was literally hearing you guys that whole time. <laughs> <laughs> like this is so. I, I'm sorry. I'm. So ho- hopefully this doesn't keep being a problem. Right now I'm just in... start, when you st- when you keep pausing mid question, I'm just gonna fill in where I think you're going. That's a... yeah, just just rip for me. I mean right now, but right now I'm in my own little NBA bubble. So because I'm in I'm in 14 day quarantine. So I guess you're gonna 14 day quarantine. Right so now. I guess I guess the internet's a little off. If it keeps being a problem, maybe I'll turn off my camera or something. Um, <laughs> anyway, what was I? In, where was I? Well, okay, wait. I, I know you're, you're definitely going a little off track. Turns you're asking kind of if there's always kind of dumb picks, which I think there is. But I think, I think this is where we could kind of lead into um, your Sam Decker hijinks and also kind of the makings of an NBA draft bust. Well, yeah, I, I just want to talk about the, just this specifically. Too. Do, you, do you think teams have got smarter at all? Like, there's always going to be like the Anthony Bennett's, the Derek Williams, like the Evan Turner's. Like, just, like, looking back, it's like, oh, my God, like, how did that even happen? But, like, but I guess, it, you know, it still kind of happened somewhat recently. You saw, like, Okafor going high and whatever. Like, do you think there's always going to be – like, do you think teams have gotten smarter or there's always going to be just, like, silly picks where you're like, how did they go number one and stuff? I don't think teams have gotten smarter. I mean, I've there's always going to be a bad pick at the top of the draft. There's always going to be a – like, you know, look back five years from now and, like you said, how does Okafor go before Porzingis and – and, uh, you know, you can play that game with every draft. And I think we're going to continue to play that game in this draft and, and in drafts to come. It's just tough. Like, it's it's not – you can identify talent. I think the toughest part is just guessing who's going to get better. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's that's really the challenge. Like, any idiot can, like, sit down and be like, okay, here are his strengths and here are his weaknesses. Like, this guy's really talented. But once he gets into the league, like, you know, is Devin Booker going to, like, go from 10 points a game in college to – like 30 a game, you know, like who, who's can you predict is going to just keep getting better. And that's really the challenge. Um, and then, and then of course there's just like the guys who like, like Wiggins, like Wiggins had clear talent and yeah. everyone kind of said like Wiggins had to go one, including myself. Um, but he just didn't really figure out like after how many years to apply to winning. Same with Jabari. I mean, same with. I mean, Jabari Parker was a he was a way better player before he had the ACL tears. But I mean, we he thought he it, it seemed like he was a can't miss prospect. You know what I mean? It was like he was a he was a universal number two. And Wiggins and Jabari were like Melo and LeBron part yeah. two. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, right. And Bead was right behind, but that injury, honestly, the the injury was like such a. It was like, how do you suddenly evaluate? everything that's going on with his injury because Embiid was number one, at least for me, Embiid was one. And then I moved him down the board uh, after that injury. That's another thing. It, it's a whole other topic of like, how do you assess injuries? Cause honestly, I think at this point we look back, like forget pre-draft injuries, like don't let them affect 
your draft yeah. stock because an injury for the most part is like a short term thing. Like Killian, Killian Tilly, I feel like is a first round talent, you know what I mean? In terms of the modern NBA, but I feel like he's someone that could definitely be um, overthought in terms of his injury history. Like, have you oh. heard? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, Karis LeVert was like a guy too with his foot and, and uh, you know, he had foot problems in college, but like who cares about foot problems when you're 19, 20 years old? Yeah. So I don't know. That's just my take, but uh teams take so much into account. Sometimes I always say they overthink, like they have too much information. Cool. So that, so that's kind of where I want to take it in terms of this specific draft cycle. And um, when we both did a deep dive on your makings of a draft bust, um, I think you did a really, really good job of identifying um, the certain kind of harbingers and the things you'd look for in the makings of a draft bust, whether it's um, them just having a, a show out NCAA tournament and scouts catching on to, to five hot games, um, or if someone's kind of like a, like you said, like a Stanley Johnson um, master of none. Um, and that's kind of where, in terms of this draft, do you think it's possible that t- it, teams might do a better job evaluating talent without having those, um, maybe bl- like the, the distractions that come with like an NCAA tournament? Yeah, I've said that in the past. Like, I actually think that some of the, um... The, the things that they're missing this year in the pre-draft process, like no real NBA combine and, and fewer workouts, like that works to some of these teams' benefit. Like the thought that these guys, these scouts watch these guys for 30-plus games in college, plus however long they tracked them in high school. Some of these guys have been in college for multiple years. And then, like, they can get swayed during a one-on-one workout. Like that's crazy. And also interviews. Like, I, I totally get you want a high-character guy, you know, it's like a job interview. You don't want to bring in somebody who's – a piece of shit you want to bring in like a good guy who people like um but like can he play basketball that's really the biggest thing and sometimes you can get swayed by like a really nice guy like Tyrese Halliburton this year is going to go high in the draft I think he's going to go top five in the draft I have him closer to 10 to 15 yeah. on my board but he's such a such a nice guy and so easy to be around and coachable and smart and articulate and he's definitely going to get a team to, to reach on him early. And not that, not that that's a bad thing, but I think that teams just put a lot of stock into certain things pre-draft. And this year they're going to have fewer opportunities to kind of overthink. Well, this is now with a guy like Obi, for example, who you, I think you were the first to put out there that he was really the most universally well-liked, not, not the most liked, but in terms of there being so much disparity with the other prospects, he was the most kind of consistently, um, liked and I think it's kind of like the opposite on draft Twitter yeah in terms of like and, yeah like Obi gets a lot of and we're I mean I buy his offense um, but I'm definitely we're, I'm definitely a skeptical of his his defensive fit and his age and kind of a lot of the draft Twitter oh they talk about his hit mobility I kind of want to hear from you if you think that's a load of at NBA Twitter boredom bullshit, or if you think there's some real questions there. Um, yeah, draft Twitter is brutal. So, I mean, I mean I'm yeah. talking about overthinking, like there's so many stats accessible now and available and people, again, they dive into so many of these ridiculous stats that I, th- and, and like, yeah, hip turning. And I, I understand it's important to take that into the equation. And, but it's just like a tiny little piece of, of, I mean, what happens if Obi Toppin's averaging 23 and 10, but he's like an okay defender or not, you know, John, I mean, that's what we think. It's like worst case scenario. He's John Collins. Yeah. Guy. That's the, that's the comparison I've, I've been using. Like a guy who's, he's going to be productive. He's going to shoot between 50 and 60% from the field. If he's not like a big time rim protector, is that such a problem? I mean, I don't think he makes your team worse. Yeah. Obviously there, and there are also ways to kind of mask those defensive problems. If you build the, you know, a team around him, it's tougher to get a 20 and 10 guy, you know, than it, than it is to, to, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, I think people overthink a little bit with, with OB and yeah, I did see some of the draft Twitter is brutal with him. I mean, brutal. nobody seems to like, um, we well, kind of brutal too. I kind of want to hear, so I'm also another, another person that I'm kind of off now who I, I was really into at the start of the draft cycles. I'm not a big, um, I mean, Anthony Edwards guy. Because it, it's it scares me too much that it's like okay like another Wiggins or Dion Waiters with athleticism. What have you kind of heard about um, kind of the level of stock that teams are putting into maybe the stuff that are worrisome about him, like the shot selection, maybe the maturity, um, or is it just like okay if you just look at raw athleticism and talent, 
he's the best in the draft and the rest we can figure out later. Like I, don't know. I, I mean, I think in terms of talent and skill, he has the best ratio. He has got the best balance of both like six, five, two twenty five, explosive. You can't beat his physical profile for a two guard. And then skill wise, he's not just an athlete. Like he creates his own shot with advanced moves. He's got three point range. Um, I, but there are legit concerns about like whether that talent can translate to winning basketball. I mean, he's there's possessions where he pounds the ball for 25 seconds and then launches it. And, and I, I, especially so, I'm a I'm a big uh, Kentucky basketball guy, and I remember very specifically last year. I mean, they Georgia and Kentucky had some big games, but I just his his affect on the court. I remember he hit a big shot. I think going into the first half, but the celebration just going into halftime, it, it was cra- It was as if they won the game. Um, and I, I don't know. I think, I think it's, he's a guy where it really depends on the fit, like uh, the team. Yeah. So I kind of go back and forth. So I, I agree with, with, with the fit. So the thing is, he's a guy who needs the ball and um, I wouldn't want my offense, offense running through his particular shot selection and his style of play. And just knowing him, you know, having watched his games in high school and, and, and been to some of them and watched the way he acts in the locker room with his teammates and stuff, like, I have a hard time believing that he's the type of guy who's going to suddenly change his game. Um, and so I'm, I'm lower. I had Edwards number one coming into the season. He was my number one guy just based on that talent and skill level. And, like, we would see how it would go from there. Teams are definitely scared about yeah. his, his personality. Um, and, and his drive for winning, like, even if you just follow his Instagram account, like, you know, stuff like that, I think worth, worth tracking. Like he, he looks like he's more concerned about going number one and getting like endorsements and stuff. than he really cares about winning. I mean, his team was 13 out of 14 um, in the SEC and, and, um, and, and then the idea of like, okay, well, maybe he should go to a good team like Golden State. He could play a little bit more to his strengths, but he's, he's, He's not very good off the ball. Like when, and, and just going back to high school, when they would take him out of the game and they double him and he's forced to stand around in the wings and stuff, like you forget he's in the game. He doesn't really know. Yeah, he disengages. He's not a good spot of shooter. And then he kind of drifts and loses interest if he's not the go-to guy. So I question about his fit if he goes to a good team. And now I'm just questioning everything about him, honestly. Yeah. And, and that's something yeah. that is over. I'm definitely overthinking. Like he's going to be – the comparison I use for him is Zach Levine, where I expect him to be productive. I expect him to score a lot but it doesn't translate to winning basketball. I think, yeah, yeah. that's, that's, I mean, kind of, that's how I, I mean, would you agree with the, the thought that um, with Golden State this year, they're, they're looking for maybe a specific piece rather, I mean, if they were shooting for potential, you know what I mean? I mean, at, at two, then they're looking at, okay, LaMelo and Anthony Edwards, but I feel like it could be a super surprising thing where their pick is one of uh, Onyeka, Okoro, or Denny. Like that's kind of the three guys I, I see um, could, I think that's what the surprise. Like, what do you see in terms of the top of the draft, especially in Minnesota? Like that's such a weird um, kind of constructed team and taking LaMelo doesn't really work there. I feel like um, what, what, what's your kind of your sense about the top of the draft? I think Golden State is going to try and get that balance of long-term prospect, but a long-term prospect who can help them on the rookie deal over the next couple of years. Um, and so I'm not the biggest James Wiseman guy, but from what I hear from my sources close to Golden State and the general thinking around the league is that they're going to lean towards Wiseman over Edwards. From what I'm told, they're not high on Edwards. What's the, what's the argument for Wiseman over Onyeka? Because I personally, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I'm, a, I'm way bigger on Onyeka than I am on Wiseman. Yeah, I put a Kongu over I, Wiseman like every two him, games. You had him on three at your, on your big board today. Yeah, and I did, and honestly, I usually try not to do knee-jerk reactions like early in the season, but I, I think it took two, two or three games for me to put Okongu I mean, at six over Wiseman, who has always been in my late lottery range. But um, like, if he, if people are shooting for that Bam prototype and looking like how how I feel like people are, are overthinking Anyeka. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I think he's like skill more way more skilled than Wiseman is at least in terms of like functional skill that he can go to every game I know you see the highlights of Wiseman taking fall away jumpers and the occasional three and sometimes he'll dribble the ball up but like those are highlights he doesn't do that every game and he can't do that every game and he doesn't really have a good feel for when to pull off those shots when to when to like try for a fall away jumper 
or what to try and like, you know, handle the ball and take it the full length of the court. He doesn't have a good feel for that. And even defensively, he's, he's not the greatest away from the basket and making reads that's, and stuff like that. They, they talk about him as if he's this defensive anchor, but if you're drafting a defensive anchor, especially in terms of you're looking at like just pure defensive IQ and instincts, I mean, it's definitely a combo. The... Yeah, totally. I mean, Wiseman's going to block shots. He's going to be up in the leaderboards, NBA and block shots. Seven six wingspan and seven one two forty. I mean, it's just naturally like he can't not block shots with that size. You know, yeah. you know like by accident he's going to block shots. But um, but in terms of impact and, and defensive impact and making the right reads and rotations and not fouling and not jumping and stuff like that, like I don't buy it. He's got a long way to go. On the other hand, also DeAndre Ayton is the same way, and Ayton's definitely gotten better. Yeah, yeah. That that's what I that's that's my comparison. I'm not you know this the most in-depth draft guy, but Eden's a guy I think of a lot when I think about Wiseman because it's kind of a similar thing where it's like, ooh, he like dunks and he averages 20 and 10 and two blocks. He's pretty good. And then it was like, no, no, no. Like he's not actually very good. Like he has the worst offensive instincts. But then like he kind of immediately, not immediately, but you know, he's, he's all of a sudden improved on that. And like you said, Wiseman has yeah. like, like a very impressive wingspan. He's athletic. He has that shooting touch. Do you think he could be – like, I'm not, I'm, not, I, I'm still, like, definitely Onyeka over Wiseman, but do you also think that maybe there's a little too much overthinking with Wiseman too that, you know, even though he's rough along the edges, that, like, with those skills and intent – you know, I don't know if the details are right word, but just with those measurements and with, you know, like a base of being a competent shooter, do you think there's maybe a little overthinking going on with him too? Yeah, probably. I'm sometimes I I'm like shit. I'm a little too hard on him um, because he's 19 and he has nice yeah, touch for, in the, from the mid range. He played two games, right? It was yeah. He played three games and I think like the first two were like against colleges you never heard of, where the tallest guy is like six three, and I think it was just like you know dunking on like a Fisher Price hoop, and then the and then the Oregon game, he um, he got two quick fouls. So he was totally taken out of that first game. He also is just like another turn off. He's not very passionate. He's very quiet. Um, he doesn't play with a lot of energy. It scouts coming into this season, the, the bigger seems concern. Gets, it seems if he gets his own, in his own head, if something goes wrong, it, 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 I don't know. From what I've watched him, I feel like he just locks up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he doesn't, he just, you know, he's not, like you think like, you know, obviously we hate when guys complain about fouls, but he picked up like a pretty cheap foul in that Oregon game. And it was a huge game for him from a scouting perspective. Bob Myers was there in the front row. ESPN, his first big game. And the second foul was such a weak call. He didn't even like pretend to argue. He just like walked off the floor. Like you want to see a little more. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. But there are, certain, there are certain NBA guys where he's just going to turn them off with his lack of passion. And that doesn't mean he's not going to be a good player, but it's just a, a little slight turn off. I get it. Um, okay, so I think the the next kind of duo of players I want to talk about is the Florida State too, because um, we were both big Vassal guys, and I mean, I think I think there's been a little worrying since that. I mean, that Twitter video blew up, right? Um, but also, I I don't really know what to make of Patrick Williams because part of me is like, okay, he he could be one of the safest prospects in the draft, but another part of me really points towards. Um, maybe that master of none category from what makes uh, an NBA draft was like a stand, like a longer Stanley Johnson who you're like, okay, he's a good defender. You can project that he's going to be able to knock down an NBA three. Um, but what's kind of your take on those two? So before the season, we'll start with Patrick Williams because before the season, he's one of the guys that I didn't know was, I, I didn't follow as much. Like, of course I knew him, but I didn't, I didn't see him live. Um, he wasn't, I don't remember him being like a big, Part having a big contribution in, in any of the big All Star events, and so I kind of had like a blank slate with him coming in, and you know he averaged nine points a game, so it's hard to get like too excited. But I was told before the season I was like, watch out for Patrick Williams as a potential number one overall candidate, and um, one overall, oh my God, this was just yeah. He had one fan like like one of his high school coaches or a couple guys were just like watch him because. Off the floor, he's really smart, and he really works hard, and he has this unique skill package. Now, Florida State, like, they're known for they share the ball. They play the right way. Nobody ever dominates the ball. Um, but, like, if you're buying into the flashes, 
turning into like regular occurrences, then he's got the chance to have one of the most unique trajectories of any prospect. He's also the youngest NCAA prospect in the draft this year. He yeah. just turned 19. And so I think if you're going to bet, like to slot him top 10, like I do, you have to bet on a lot of improvement. Actually, in my mind, I always think about, he reminds me of like a forward version of Adebayo, where in college he was like more of a power player, but deep down he had this, this hidden skill of passing and some touch that we didn't really see. And we only saw it a couple times at Florida State, but it's, but it's there. And I think if he's the type of guy, from what I hear, who's going to maximize his potential, smart worker, hard worker, um, then I think it's a bet worth taking. Because if you can get a 6'8", 225 forward who can shoot off the dribble, he shot 41% on pull-ups. He was a physical finisher. A lot of dribble passes ran pick and rolls. I think scored 10 out of 20 pick and roll possessions, but some nice lefty passes here and there, defensive playmaker all over the place. I just think if you can put that all together, he's got one of the most unique ceilings in this draft, but I'll admit it's going to take a lot of improvement to get there. Now, do you think it's the sort of case where um, him and Vassal is completely dependent on fit regarding who you would take first? Like maybe the Knicks would go Vassal um, or like, and then, a team like I don't know I, I feel like Patrick Williams would be like if he dropped a little bit into like the early teens and he could go to like the Celtics at 14 right. like I, I think that would be amazing so I think the best place for Williams is a good team that could be patient and he could just like take it slow the first couple of years figure things out play to his strengths let the game come to him and then kind of like build on his little mistakes every year without having like I as much as I love Patrick Williams if he goes to the Knicks I'm just I'm scared for him because yeah. it's going to be like Kevin Knox. Like, he's going to not have talent to play off. He's going to force to create something out of nothing. And it, it could get ugly early. And who knows how that could affect his confidence. Vassell is kind of like a plug-and-play guy. I kind of, even over the past couple of weeks, and that's nothing to really to do with that video, although it was weird to see him change it. It was weird. Sometimes, sometimes do, I just do – you, Do you think he changed it, or do you think it's just like we hadn't I seen him take threes from like five feet behind the line before? Yeah, it's yeah, like I, I had a massive yeah, reaction yeah. that I'm like, all right, he's shooting like pretty further well, back. We were also we were also getting the side, like a, a side angle that you don't get on TV. Yeah, I, I think we, everyone blew, out of, blew the thing out of proportion of like change mechanics. He had weird – he's got a really high release in general. Yeah. This one just looked like – I said it kind of – it kind of reminded me of like Richard Lewis release a little bit. It reminded me of like Marcus Camby, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, really high. Like, Mark I mean, was mine. listen, if you can get that, be nice than Richard Lewis. <laughs> I, listen, it's a positive to have that shoot, to, yeah. to, to be able to shoot that high. I mean, he gets that shot off, you know, when he's like not even trying to create a shot, he could just shoot over a guy. But anyway, Vassell is just as much as I want to buy like the improved pull up this year, I just can't picture him being anything more than three and D. I know I've heard the interview and the longer Covington is kind of like his. Yeah. Mikael Bridges is the guy I use and I like Mikael Bridges, yeah. but yeah. I don't, yeah, I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> I, I don't see a ton of upside. And, no. um, and, and I don't, I, if the Knicks took him, like, I don't think it would be a bad pick. It just wouldn't be a very exciting pick. Do you, this yeah. is, I mean, I think there's a lot of talk within the Knicks fan base about um, a core over Vassal. I mean, Vassell. And I was – I switched. Now I, I was not big on Okoro before because I, I still struggle with buying the shot. But I'm kind of looking at him now more as he's a way better playmaker than I gave him credit for in terms of his passing ability. Um, and I think no matter what, like I think Budim, we talked about this a, a, a few weeks ago, but if he's if he's early Boston Marcus Smart in, in just from a defensive standpoint where it's like, okay, he's shooting 28% from three um, but playing really good defense – I, He's good I, at everything else. That's so yeah, pretty good. I'm, I'm kind of now leaning Okoro um, as as if the Knicks are going to target a, a lockdown D wing. What, what's what's your thoughts on that between those two um, contrasted? Yeah, in a vacuum, I have Okoro better than Vassell for. He's more creative off the dribble. We didn't get to see it that much at Auburn, but he actually graded pretty well. He actually was like 11 of 18 isolation situations, and he graded well in pick and rolls. And well, 18 this, isolation situations is crazy too. They were they were like didn't happen a lot, um, yeah. but he kind of converted the opportunities he got. And um, listen, I don't expect him to be a scorer like that of isolation, and I don't expect him to be a shooter. Uh, I talk, so once. A scout I talked to early in the season said something to me that stood out. And he's like, if you're betting on Okoro, you're betting on gains from his intangibles. And the idea that he can reach what literally the 
player he used was Marcus Smart. He could be a, become a Marcus Smart level shot maker. Yeah. But he's yeah. never going to be a, an efficient shooter, but someone who can make open shots. They're not, and, they can't lay off. They can't lay off you, and you might have a game where you hit five. And you know what I mean? Like that's kind of. Yeah, and his value is going to because going to show up on defense and hustle plays, and. Uh, and, and he's very – he shot 60% inside the arc, so he doesn't take bad shots. Unless, you know, this is totally different than Marcus Smart, but he, like, doesn't – he can't – a bad game from Okoro can't hurt you, you know. Like, he's not yeah. going to do anything to to hurt the offense in terms of taking a bad shot or making a wild play or over dribbling or anything like that. But uh, there are – over the past couple of weeks, I've talked to scouts who, who don't see it with Okoro, who, who really question him as a top-10 pick as a guy. Like, how could you take a 6'6 guy who's not very a creative – not a very creative scorer – and isn't an accurate shooter. And one scout I talked to actually the other day was like, if you look at the history of college players, and of course he only played one year, so it's kind of tough to say it, but college players who shot below uh, 30% from three and 70% from the free throw line, like their chances of improving as shooters or becoming decent shooters is not very high. Yeah. yeah. That, well, okay. So now with a guy that's really risen, who I don't know what to make. Can, can, can I just say one thing about Okoro first before we move on? Um, I that that's a fair point, but do you think that? Do you, I guess I guess my thing with Okoro is I don't really care. I mean, I care of course if he can improve as a shooter, but my biggest concern is this: like, like as you mentioned, he shot sixty percent from inside the arc. Do you think there's concerns with that being translating the NBA as like you know? I mean, he's only. 6'6", six, six, and I, I saw in your article you listed him as like a small forward, power forward, which is probably what he might end up having to play despite only being 6'6". Six, six. Do you think there's concerns with, you know, this, uh, like, you know, shortest dude being able to translate that 60% shooting inside in the NBA? I think his shot selection is so good that he's not going to shoot 60% inside the arc, but he's such a good finisher. And, like, I'm not – I don't think – I, I don't think – I think I, mean, I don't think he finished really well because he was just stronger than everybody else. Like some of his finishes, they're like finesse and footwork and midair adjustments and lefties. And he's a good finisher. And he's got he's got that euro step in his bag to like elude defenders and stuff. And 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 again, he's got good timing on his cuts and just like he just doesn't take bad shots. And so I think he's going to shoot a good percentage, relatively speaking, for for his particular position. I'm not really worried about him being a six, six power forward today. I actually think, you know, he compensates for that like one or two inches with, with his muscle. Well, I mean, that, that's why I like him. Mm-hmm. I mean, his, like, in terms of, he is one of the most NBA ready bodies you'd have to say in the entire draft. Yeah. He's, his, his legs are trees and he's also like, he's really um, uh, got a mature approach to the game. I think if you're like the Knicks, that's a big selling point. Like he's professional. And so is, so is RJ. Like I think one of the biggest things I loved about Barrett this year, and I had a lot of questions about him coming into the draft, and I still have a lot of questions about him. But to me, he handled being a pro really well. I mean, he was tough. He uh, Obviously, a lot of shit goes on in, with the Knicks, and he, he handled himself pretty well. He was a total pro, and I think Okoro comes off with just like this professionalism approach. Well, this kind of takes me on to another player who's been – one of the biggest risers in the pre-draft process, especially with the news of him gaining 30 pounds and another inch. And then now it's like, oh, he's broken the record for the NBA basketball IQ test. And there's so much mystery around Tyrell Terry. Um, and I feel like there's some people that are like, oh, he, he, he's going to be the people that, uh, he's going to be the person that people regret passing on in the top seven. And then there are people that like, I don't really see it. Um, he's a top 20 prospect, but what's the hoopla about? Where is, where's your position on that? I just talked to a scout that was like, I'm ready to like say, okay, he's definitely moving up. And I just talked to this scout and he's like, should have got back to school. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> For, I mean, there are some people, and I've, another people, another guy who said, you know, fringe first rounder, or maybe it sounds like he's rising. I think he's got a shot at the first round. I'm thinking like he's got a shot to go lottery. Yeah, that's, and so listen. All it takes is one team. There's a disconnect between what you think of kind of maybe draft Twitter and maybe um, the the media and kind of how the NBA sees him. Yeah, I, I, all it takes is one team. And I've said kind of I said this early in the season in, in a tweet I think that like one team is going to think that Tyrell Terry has a lot of upside. Like just one team is going to see like this guy is so smooth. 
He's CJ McCollum. He's got that Steph Curry. I mean, I'd love him on Philly. I think I think if he if Philly could find a way to to get him, I think he's a yeah. He, and I think Philly's interested in him. I've heard. Um, I gotta check my text messages, but uh, I think the Lakers and Milwaukee. I think a lot of teams in the twenties are hoping he falls to them. Yep. Uh, yep. But at the same time, if the Celtics took him at fourteen, I would be shocked. Now, moving on to kind of some of the guards of the draft, um, especially, first of all, I, I got to talk about some of my Kentucky's boys. Um, thank you very much for adding Emmanuel quickly to your top 50 <laughs> because I was going to come into the bone to pick over, it. over you having Cassius Winston 25 slots above Emmanuel quickly. That was one of my things where I was like, okay. Um, but now that he made it to 47, I don't know. I get, I get the hesitation with him. But watching so much of him and, and, and seeing so many Kentucky guards in the past, um, yes, his ceiling is is definitely low with his his body and his his lack of play, like secondary playmaking and um, creativity off the dribble. But I just feel like it's going to be so hard for him not to just be an elite catch and shoot three point. You know what I mean? Like I, I just feel like his floor is so high. Listen, if I, the thing with big boards is. I have him at 47, but who am I drafting for? You know, yeah. like, yeah. and yeah. so I always say that we should do a big board right after the draft because if quickly goes to like the Clippers, then suddenly he shoots up my board. Yep. So, um, no, no, I think, and especially reading your little blurb on him, it's like, okay, like fit really matters with him. And on Twitter, someone like I, if he can be paired, if he can get playing time with a, a guy who's a, he needs he needs to be on the court with a bigger guard, and the guard needs to be initiator. But if he can play off ball, um, I think that he's really going to surprise a lot of people. Especially in terms of, I love his his I mean, just his personality, and also I mean, if you project um, his free the Kentucky throw, bounce, yeah, and you project his free throw percentage, um, yeah. my Kentucky bias. The one thing I didn't love, I mean, and this is nitpicking, but it's going to be have to be part of his game at the NBA level. Is he? ranked in the 36 percentile shooting off screens and so yeah, he's no, that's 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 the one knock in terms of i mean there's only everyone could kind of stand around and catch and shoot and and i obviously quickly could do that at a high level but he's gonna have to run around a lot to get open yeah. and particularly at his size and so he's got to shoot well off screens i think the best the other thing that is going to give him a chance is that floater he's yeah he's gonna charge at him and he's got a really good floater game. best floater in the draft in my opinion in terms of just if you're just looking at that now, a guy like Maxi, okay, where he's he's kind of a, an enigma in the sense where he's a really really good defender. Um, I, I think his intangibles are really good in terms of he's just a really intense guy, super competitive. Um, but there's there's a lot of offensive projection there, and it's either being like, okay, um, is he James Young or is he Donovan Mitchell? Like, kind of that's what's your take? Because I'm for the Knicks, for example, I'd be if they took Maxi at eight. I'm not complaining one bit. Um, I'm the Kenny Payne connection. I'm happy with whatever. What's kind of your take on where people are seeing Maxi? Maxi's all over the place. And then, and then, kind of, if you could lead this into um, your take on Maxi versus Cole Anthony, because I'm very much Maxi over Cole. I'm Maxi over Cole too. Okay, cool. I like Maxi. He's top ten on my board. I put him at number eight. I think in, in this. In my big board, and he's pretty much the whole season for me. He's been eight to ten. Um, I'm totally ignoring the percentages; like they don't bother me yeah. one bit. I mean, I think he could shoot. I think he's the best finisher out of the guards in the draft. I mean, totally buying his finishing. Um, the athleticism doesn't scare me because he's such a good finisher. And uh, I don't. The, the, my big knock and my big. I, I wish he was just a better playmaker because I don't think he can be a lead decision maker. Like the guy who brings the ball up the offense and, 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 and makes all the decisions. Like, I don't think that's him. That's I think he's, he's got to play alongside a better point guard. Um, I mean, even then he had a decent assist and turnover for each year. So that, there's, there's potential there. I'd say. The thing I remember specifically, I, as a Kentucky fan, I'm not even, I'm not Nash and Hagen's guy. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely mm -hmm. not. Yeah. But in, I think there was two games this year where Higgins, it was like a weird suspension or he was out for personal reasons. And I just remember what, or I think it was maybe a game he fouled out, but I remember watching Maxi um, and quickly try to break full court press 
without having i mean higgins is one thing is he 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 was really good at just bringing it up bring the ball up and kind of setting up the offense that was the one thing i saw with maxine quickly i'm like okay like it's really hard for them to be the number one initiator yeah i think he gets led the conference in assists and and so he first of all maxie just didn't get as many opportunities to create for teammates his job was to was to score and he had to do it alongside two other guards including the conference player of the year and the conference leader in assists and so it wasn't great like it wasn't a great setup for mac um and i'm just he's just one of those guys where i'm gonna throw out the percentages and i'm using the eye test on all of his offensive moves his finishes his pull-up game his floater and from everything i hear about his character um he's like a great kid and, and po- just oozes like positive energy and and uh I know, the comparison i use for him has been lou williams and I think it would be amazing if he become Lou Williams, but I think he's going to be able to score with his limitations. And I think if, and tying it back to the Knicks, you know, for me, they're, they're, the roster is so blank in terms of there's no sure thing we can bet on. I'd fill out a list of eight guys and whoever the, the best one falls to you, you take regardless of whether he's a center or whether he's a, you know, whatever position he plays. And so for me, if, if my first seven guys are off the board, I would take Maxi. Um, you spoke about throwing out percentages, which I'm, I can be a guy that it's hard for me to do that. Though I do like see, I, like I see the vision with Maxi because, like again, I know that his 29 three point percentage is kind of misleading to how good a shooter he is. Obviously, he's like because he was like very good in high school, I think, and he he's obviously a good free throw shooter, and like you see the spectacular finishes, but. With guys like him and Edwards, like that just kind of always is a concern to me that they, you know, if you're inefficient in college, obviously you can improve, but it, it's always hard to me to like, all right, you're expecting a guy to, that's inefficient in college to then, you know, be efficient in the NBA or at least, you know, efficient to the point where you're still good. Um, how do you, like, why, where does that come into play for you? You just, like, you just think with everything else, like they'll, improve and become efficient like how I don't know what what do you think about that (laughs) I usually judge like his makes like I look at his makes and he clearly has range Um, he looks smooth when it goes in and you know I just I I like to talk to guys about work ethic I think that's big and and guys who take seriously getting better Um, like there are guys who go to the gym and then there are guys who like really go to the gym to like make sure that they leave the next day a better shooter than they were the day before and here Max has got that work that type of work ethic. And listen, he doesn't have to be a 40% three-point shooter. I mean, if he's 35% from downtown every – like Luka Doncic shoots 31% from three. Exactly, yeah. You know, so like, yeah. He just has to be, like, good enough to complement his mid-range game and floater and attacking and finishing and secondary playmaking and tough defense and, and the intangibles. Like, he just has to be good enough. I don't think he has to be knocked out. Um, speaking of looking smooth, someone – Sam and I are high on, and someone you're high on us too. I, I don't think I've ever, like, seen, like, a highlight tape. I mean, that, that may be a bit exaggeration. Watching Malachi Flynn, like, he has, like, one of the smoothest highlight games I've ever, like, seen. And then, like, I was floored that, like, after seeing that, I was like, whoa, like, his stats are, like, beautiful, where, like, you can't really find imperfection. I was like, all right, well, he's 6'1", and surely his defense sucks. And, like, he won, like, player defensive player of the year in his conference. <laughs> So it's like, I don't know, like, it's hard for me to be low on Maxi. I mean, not Maxi, sorry, uh, on Malachi. Like, what what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you have him as high as 19. So, I mean, I, I assume you yeah. have similar his thoughts. Yeah, I love him. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really understand the case of why he's not, like, a consensus top 20 guy. I guess the only thing is, and, and – this one scout who I, he's always like a skeptic, but he's always like, there's not a place for all these point guards. There's like 15 point guards who all seem like they have a good shot to be good backups, but there's not, there's not that many open positions. And so sometimes I'm thinking like, you know, maybe, maybe he's just not the, the level of competition for point guards is so high, but, uh, but Flynn to me of all those guys, like, you know, the Trey Jones and Dotson and Winston and, and, uh, handful of other like those fringe first round names to me Flynn is the guy to like reach on and and not only does he check the stat boxes but like analytics wise he led the country in win shares and 
Like yeah. he just has everything going for him, except for the fact that he's six one and you know not very strong or athletic. But he's so skilled that, and I think we've seen in recent years, like it's not a requirement for point guards to be Russell Westbrook. Like you can compensate for a limited burst with skill and IQ, and and I think that that Flynn has like you know rates ten out of ten in those categories. And even like with his burst, just personally, I don't know if you agree with this. Like, I, you know, I watch, like, uh, you know, his weakness videos, which normally, like, you watch a weakness video, like, that alone, you think he's, like, the worst player ever. I know myself. <laughs> I made I made a low-light video of LaMelo Ball from, like, his most recent game that makes him look like the worst player ever. Like, you wouldn't take him, like, top 60. Um, and, like, I watched, like, a Tyler Hero, like, weakness video recently. It was just, like, he looked like the worst player ever. Like, he wouldn't make a shot in the NBA. But, like, Malachi, like, even while watching, like, his lack of, like, burst, it's normally, like, he has a good first step and he gets by the guy. And even then, like, he just, like, kind of, like, stops. Like, he doesn't accelerate that well, maybe. Like, even as, like, that athleticism, like, I don't know if I fully – like, he seems like he has a good first step, no? Yeah, he's, he's, he's quick. He's decisive. He's, like, sharp. And, and uh, I'd say the one thing, like, you look at him sometimes and the ball looks big in his hands. You know, he's, like, just skinny. He just uh, – it just the eye test. It just doesn't pop eye test wise. Um, if you're kind of just, just like looking at him with nine other guys on the floor. But when you watch the full game, he's just. I think sometimes it's just as simple as like he's just so good. He's just a good basketball player. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't know what else to say. He's good at everything. Um, another guy. Another guy that only. Um, was, I, I don't know. I, it's kind of a, he's kind of a weird player in the sense of I really like. I really buy his game. But Grant Miller. There, there's a knock against the the strength of competition, his age. Um, but if you're just looking at isolation offense and who's who's the most plug and play, uh, easily to project production wise, I think Grant Riller's at the top of that list. I know. I, I think I put Grant Riller at 21, and he's the whole pretty much the whole season. Every time I put Grant Riller somewhere, I'm like, he should be higher. Like I'm yeah. going to regret not making him like a top 10 player in this draft. And and then the, I'm telling you. Scouts don't see it the way draft Twitter does. I know there's a lot of, I see draft Twitter a, a lot raves about Riller and, and so do I, but there are scouts who are like, yeah, he can get drafted, you know, it's second round. I don't know if they're just bullshitting me, but I honestly think that there are scouts who question whether or not he is a point guard and whether he can get the shots off he's getting off as a six three two guard. And he's got that kind of line drive release. But another guy who's just so good at creating his own shot and such a tough shot maker and the fact that he finished at such a high clip around the basket is encouraging. And he actually had a high assist rate, even though he didn't have, I think he averaged like four assists per game, but he had like something between 30, 40% uh, assist percentage, um, which is, which is a good number. And he's got some like deceptive bounce where he comes out of nowhere and explodes on you for a dunk. And um, he's just such a good offensive player that to me, I'm, in this particular draft, like I, I, I take a chance on him. I think he's 23 years old already, but, We've seen Brogdon and Devontae Graham and, and even Cam Johnson last year, good offensive players at that age, can still come in and, and, and be good NBA players and be good draft picks. And so to me, Riller is a first rounder. I don't think he's going to go first round just based on who I'm talking to, but all it takes is one team. But I, I do, again, I think he's one of those guys who's just like set up in that, on, on steel watch, somebody who's we're going to look back in a couple of years and be like, everyone kind of knew this was coming. Um, another guy, another guard who's yeah I, I i'd say he's kind of like hit or miss depending on who you're talking to you either think he's really good or not i think you had him lower in a previous uh big board and now you have him higher kira lewis i'm not like totally in love with him i mean again i you know i'm not like we you know, differ haven't been... a little bit we differ a little bit here just because i i see kind of the trepidation where you could be hesitant on on uh kira lewis but i don't know i i just I just feel like he'll eventually put it together. And if anything, I, I buy him um, and I buy his intangibles and measurables over uh, Cole's. I, I think that's kind of like the final person I have above Cole in the guard tier. And let's, let me just say for, for me, my, my concern is just that like looking at his freshman and sophomore year. Uh, and again, this is like pretty much strictly stat test. So like, kill me if you want that. Like, his his efficiency didn't really improve that much. 
which I don't know. That's, that's a knock for me. Like, you know, if you're expecting to improve the NBA, you'd like to see them improve in college. I'm not saying he didn't improve uh, what, what, and also like he didn't, I don't think he has like a very high assisted turnover ratio. I mean, it's like kind of a knock for me where, you know, I don't know, I guess this is what, what are your thoughts on all that and your takes on here? Yeah, his, listen, his freshman year, I kind of just like looked past him. He just didn't stand out to me. And he played with USA Basketball. He didn't stand out to me there. And uh, even through the first half of the season, I was kind of hesitant. Like, And then the second half of the season, his last nine games, he was so good. I think he averaged uh, like 24 with six assists on 43% shooting from three. And it just kind of came together. And I think the selling point to Lewis is he can create scoring opportunities, whatever he wants. And so I think if you put him on a good team with shot makers around him and you don't make him take the shots and don't make him make such tough passes and just keep it simple with him, he is, he'll, he'll get you a bucket in four seconds off a make off a, a made bucket or a defensive rebound. He's just so fast with the ball. that he just creates so many scoring opportunities. I think, that's really his biggest selling point. What's the difference in just skill disparity do you see between um, Lewis coming out right now and where maybe De'Aaron Fox was uh, three years ago? Well, it's also – it's worth remembering that Kyra Lewis just turned 19. Like, he's younger than, uh, than, than most freshmen. And so I think around the same age, Lewis is a better shot maker. Um, and you, you could say there – I mean, if there's someone, a prospect – I mean – I just put them in two because measurables, I kind of see them the same coming out in terms of um, just pure speed with the ball. Um, and yeah. Be like. Yeah, Fox is definitely a better athlete. Like Fox can like get up and throw down on somebody. I don't really think Lewis can. But Lewis is a little bit more comfortable from three and a, actually a very good spot-up shooter. Um, and so I think that's also a nice selling point to Lewis is that you can run him in different actions and, you can, you know, move him around and put him off the ball for a catch and shoot shot. He's, he's a pretty good three point shooter off the catch. Uh, and, in, and he didn't improve his efficiency off the dribble, but he made more of them. And so that was nice to see. And then going back to your point about like, yeah, he didn't improve his efficiency. His, he had the ball in his hands so much more this year and, and he just made a lot more shots, you know, average 18, five and five. I don't think there are many guys who've done that um, in, in recent years, or at least on 35% shooting from three. I think that the list, somebody put this out the other day, like the list of guys who've done that have all been like big time top 10 picks. But um, again, I, I don't trust Lewis as like a top 10 pick where you want him to be your quarterback for the next five years. I kind of compare him to Dennis Schroeder, just somebody yeah. who can just like create yeah. scoring opportunities, just like give him the ball, get into the lane and make things happen. And that's, that's kind of where I see his game. Now, yes, same. What, kind of a question here in terms of, um, You've had, I see you moved him, but you've had, you've been pretty high on a guy like uh, um, Jahemius Ramsey, who I think has, I think it's, he's been pretty polarizing in the sense where people either love him or they don't like him. Um, what, what have you kind of bought in with his pluses that make you worry less about the shot selection and stuff like that? I think at baseline, um, 6'4", 195, obviously his body stands out for a two guard, but he's... I buy his jumper and the ability to create shots. Like I don't see any way he can't go into the NBA and make shots. Um, and that's just like his worst case scenario. And if he just cuts down on the bad shots and the defensive lapses where he loses his man, um, I mean, he's young. Those are just like things like if he's just coached up a little bit better. Um, I, I think those are things he can improve on, but to, to come in with his level of shot making for a six, four athlete, and such a, a natural score. I mean, I just don't see any way he can't put the ball in the basket at any level. And then it's just cutting down on those like silly mental mistakes. Now, do you think that on draft night, it could really be a case where Halliburton gets taken top five and Killian Hayes is available when the Knicks pick? Like, I feel like, I feel like there's almost a weird lead up where um, if there's some guy that could surprisingly fall, and maybe if you you tell me if I'm wrong on this, I feel like there could be a disconnect in how much um, maybe the media and, and draft where loves Killian Hayes, and in terms of uh, how high he'll go. What what are you kind of seeing out of that? Yeah, I've said that before. I think the draft Twitter likes Killian Hayes a lot more than than NBA teams do. Um, Halliburton, everybody loves Halliburton. Like everybody loves Halliburton, even if they don't think he's going to be a star. 
in this draft, like what I was saying before, he's just, he'll wow you in an interview. He can't hurt you. He's just, he's with LaMelo Ball, the best passer in the draft. I guess Killian Hayes, too, are all in the same category of just great passers. He's a great spot-up shooter. You can put him off the ball. He gives you flexibility when you're building a lineup. You can take him and draft and then go out and get a point guard in free agency. You can take him and play him, you know, at the one or two and, and get a two guard next to him. And um, he just can't hurt you. He's just a good, smart, high character guy. And uh, with Killian Hayes, I think there are more concerns about his shot, whether he can blow by guys. He has a sky high turnover rate. Um, what do you, to have him second on your big board, what are the things that you really love about him? I think he's the, the most well-rounded guard in the draft. And I love the fact that he just got much better from, from one year to the next. And he puts up, even before, you know, like all the FIBA tournaments, he was always a standout. And last year wasn't a great year. And he bounced back this year and just just got better in, in, in all the areas he needed to. And I think if you look at his statistical profile, along with the fact he's 6'5 and 19 years old, um, I mean, I always, I always forget that he's six five. I always in my head, I I never have him that that big. Yeah, he's got size for the position. Um, he's a very crafty finisher, despite you know the knock on his explosiveness. He shot a good rate around the hoop, great floater touch. He's got a good pull up game, forty one percent on pull ups, despite the fact that he's not known for shooting. He shot over eighty five percent from the free throw line every single year, which is yeah. again is another promising indicator. And the fact that he doubled his three point mix. Um, this year from last year is a, another good sign and, and just got much better as a shot creator. Like this year we started seeing like step backs and side, like Damian Lillard sidestep jumpers and just a whole new tricks that we didn't see from a year ago. And so, I don't know, it's just like a, a guy you want to continue to bet on, just bet on that trajectory. And, and I don't, I don't think he's going to be a, a superstar NBA point guard. I compare him to Goran Dragic where he's like a fringe all-star a good point guard who can start in the league for the next 10, 15 years um, and, and a very good playmaker. And if he just becomes a good enough shooter, I mean, Dragic was a non-shooter coming into the NBA. Now he's like an accurate shooter who makes two threes a game. And now, so uh, are there, are there worries about Hayes's um, like intangibles or are those pretty, they're like, they're pretty good. In terms of, I, I just don't, I know nothing about him in terms yeah, of. Yeah. There's no red flags or anything. Um, He's he turns the ball over a lot. Um, there's I haven't heard anything negative about him. I know personality wise, he's kind of laid back. Yeah, he's kind of quiet and cool and calm. And but uh, I I don't there's nothing I've seen or heard that would let it affect my evaluation. Now um, what's what's your tip? What, do you want to? I was just gonna ask about Lamelo Boot. Well, yeah, I was gonna, I, I was gonna ask the same thing. So I guess like, well, I don't know. Look, let me ask it, I guess, because yeah, you, you, you got it last year. I mean, it probably has the same thing. Well, first, I just wanted to say that, like, speaking of uh, Killian and Drozic, I learned that Zoran played next to yeah, Killian, you did, which, like, you did. which makes me happy. So maybe, like, secondhand, like, Dro- Drozic effect, <laughs> like, Zoran, Zoran, like, can teach Killian some Goron skills. Who knows? Um, nice but, research. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but... Anyway, I, I probably the same thing Summer's gonna ask. Maybe not. Just the fit with Lamelo is like it's kind of hard to place Lamelo. Like you had an article, top that's fits for Lamelo. That's like, exactly what I was gonna say. In terms of yeah. no idea where he fits. I mean, Charlotte would take him. I feel like, but that's really like. I... But it, it, but but um, like you said in your article, top fits for Lamelo. You had like the Wolves, like bad, which I agree, and they're the number one team. And it's like, how can you draft him next to like? Towns and Russell to have like the worst defense ever and also like that's three ball dominant guys and then like the best fit is the Warriors and it's like are they really going to take a chance on Lamelo when they just got rid of Danzo Russell who's like you know not the same player but another ball dominant bad defender so do you think there's a chance that Lamelo could fall back in the draft like out of nowhere despite I know obviously you're high on him and most are but like there's a chance he could randomly fall just from like weird fits yeah, and because, probably, think, like, do you think character concerns? I mean, you talk about that. Like, is, is there a concern with that with him at all? Yeah, he's not like a, he's he's not going to win anyone over in an interview. In fact, I've heard more negative things about him. Like, he's just um, he's not like the most like charming guy in the world. Um, but I think in terms of if you're looking at the best player in the draft, I don't think 
that his character is, if you think he's the best prospect in the draft, I don't think that a bad interview from him is going to change your opinion. But I do think he could fall just depending on how the trades work out. And so I, I, from what I've heard, and not, I've reported this, but it was kind of taken out of context. But like the people I talk to all think that LaMelo goes one to Minnesota if they stick. Um, that's just what people think Minnesota will do. If there's a trade, like, um, you know, if Charlotte moves up to one and takes Wiseman um, and Golden State, I could see, I don't know what Golden State's going to do if Wiseman's gone. I really don't know. I'd just be guessing. You think, I mean, you really think that, I mean, here's my question. You think that if Minnesota takes LaMelo, that they keep their currently constructed team? Because I feel like if you have D'Angelo Russell, LaMelo, and Carl Anthony Towns, or the same but theoretically, team. Malik Beasley, like the plan is still probably to bring him back. Like that's like the yeah. worst defensive that's team worst defensive. ever. Yeah, like would be very fun. Yeah, I was, when I did my own my own logic and, and the, my first couple of mock drafts, I had Anthony Edwards going at one, and then I changed just based on what I was hearing. And the logic was, they just got uh, Russell to run the offense, and like Russell's not the type they're gonna dra- they're gonna trade for Russell and then say okay. We're actually, Russell, we're going to take the ball out of your hands and give it to LaMelo, this 19-year-old kid who's, yeah. like, wild. And they, and they don't work. To, I mean, I just don't see them as, like, complementary pieces in the backcourt together. Like, I don't know. I don't either, but I could also see why a team could convince itself that it's nice to have two playmakers in the court. It's nice to have two oversized passers in the backcourt, and that could be a plus. Um, and, you know, that's just, like, I could see a team talking themselves into it. Do you think it's possible he's not doing any of these workouts because he got a promise from them and it's just like, okay, it's done? Like, no. no, I don't think anyone's made him a promise. I think that he's going to limit the teams that see him just and because that's what they do with these top guys. And I, rem- I remember you were kind of the first person that um, made us think, wow, like the, the, the Knicks are thinking of trading up. And now there's also been some buzz about them trading back. Um, do you expect them to stay put at eight for draft night, or could you still see there being movement uh, either up or down? In, in... I think there's a better case to go down now. I, I mean, I, I don't think that they would, and I, I'm, I, I've said this multiple times, like I'm kind of unsure about what I'd do if, if Golden State just said, just give us Mitchell Robinson. You know, I think I would be willing to do it. I could understand why Nick fans wouldn't, because he's the only sure thing really on the roster. But anyway, I don't think it's going to come to that. And I, I doubt that the Knicks would, would do it. I think there's more of a chance they trade down because that group from 8 to 15 or whatever are, like, all the same guy. But I, said, I, mean, I would way rather than trade down. Um, and I feel like their pick at, at 15 would be safer than their pick at 3, weirdly enough. Um, yeah, and uh, you're right. I also think, right, for Leon Rose, like, there's less pressure, I guess, on him if he yeah. screws up at 8 compared to I mean, you know, if he screws up at 15. I saw that, but there was the that one trade that got floated out, which was like uh, eight and DSJ for Magic thirteen and Chuma Okiki, and I was like, "There's no." First of, all, first of all, Orlando's not trading Okiki. Thank you. I was like, how, no. "Why? Why would why, like?" I thought that was the craziest. And there were people, there were Knicks fans in the comment section of that tweet being like, "We can't give up on DSJ." So I'm like, "Okay, you're off <laughs> Okiki in the thirteenth. We we'll take Okiki at eight and like give it a you know like yeah. dude I mean, I'd have Okiki top ten in this draft. I was about to say wouldn't Okiki be top seven? In, I mean he'd be above Patrick Williams I feel like in this draft. Yeah, he'd be right in that mix. Yeah. But uh, like, I mean, any, if Orlando's going to move anyone, I mean I had rumors of them trying to move Mo Bamba during his rookie season, and that was like two years ago, and, and he hasn't done anything since. So I'm sure Orlando and I don't know. I'm just speculating that if they're going to try and move up, they're going to try and use Bamba as a, as a guy to package it to pick with. Um, have you heard anything about the Knicks at all? Like, obviously, everyone's like, they're super tight-lipped now, but have there been, like, any reports at all, whether it's, like, you know, probably, like, you know, a, a you know, like, in a smoke screen or anything, or? No. I haven't heard it. Not from directly from Knicks people. They are, and, and, I, and I know some of them, but they are, there's definitely, like, a meeting before the draft, you know, with, with all new front office. And they definitely made some type of, you know, made it clear that like, keep everything in house. That's pretty cool. Uh, I like that from teams though, I guess. That, I mean, like there's, uh, and then there's Knicks. I mean, there are Knicks, you know, Ian Begley has been on the beat for however many years. Like I'm not saying that he doesn't, and, and Berman, I'm not saying they don't have their sources, 
but yeah. um, I don't think that they're like going out and leaking stuff and and now, could do you see you don't see any like you you for example like a team like the Hawks there was maybe there was a rumor today I think that's like okay the Hawks are looking to add a veteran piece do you think there'll be a team in this top seven that's going to trade their pick for a, a any like out of the box veteran or do you think it's going to be okay teams want prospects now um like do you, do you have any inkling that there's going to be one maybe top 10 blockbuster now it would make sense Like a, a a guard of the few, like a I don't know if if I if I'm when is Phoenix picking ten or okay yeah. yeah I mean I'm Phoenix and for example like a guy like Maxi is available at ten or even I I feel like the, I I wonder where a guy like Cole Anthony goes I mean I I feel like for him to succeed he needs to go in the twenties and be a backup point guard for a good team. Um, like yes, yeah, that would that would be ideal for him if he goes to a team where he could be like the sixth man or just focus on scoring. I mean, that's really what he does best. And if he could do that for a good team for the next five years. I was still a little like that's still in the middle to high tier. I feel like I've even heard some things about him slipping into the, the mid twenties. Yeah. You know, I tweeted out a, a couple of weeks ago. I talked to an executive, and this is the lowest I heard. The executive told me he had him 35 on his board. He just I, hated him. <laughs> I, I, I'm just letting you know. So I've, um, this is actually, I've had to tone down my Cole Anthony um, slander on this podcast, but I've um, peripherally known him for, for many, many years. And so my biggest nightmare uh, in the world is the Knicks drafting Cole, and then I have to be a, a Heat or a Thunder fan for the next for the next four years. We we've we've told this around like every pod. We like went to Knicks camp with Cole Anthony when we were like ten, and he gave us he gave us a bad like he's our bad like personality guy, just an off like ten year old Cole Anthony. Like he's he's been down on our boards for like a decade times over the summer, just in random places, and he always rubs me the wrong way and um he used to whine a ton on the basketball court and cry and that stuff never left me that's the biggest that's the thing i hear all the time is like he's whining. he, he talks whining. shit he complains i will say like you know I've, I've seen him around the city you know like working out at 10 o'clock on a wednesday night yeah, yeah. oh he, he loves basketball that's yeah, like yeah. he really loves basketball i'm not i've been with him I've, I've i've been with him at the, i've been in the same uh gcc like court sm once or twice he was practicing dunks it was in the background of the now deleted instagram video yeah. Yeah. um one more question before like our final little segment um just we, we touched on tyrese halliburton a little bit it's talking about like year to year improvement i was well, kind of surprised oh, and I'll sorry. Down. with you you have Tyrese at 10, which I think, and you, but you've even said you have met 10 on your big board, but he's someone because of his um, intangibles makeup, you could see going top five. And that's, I think, where me and Bloom's disconnect is, is he seems so safe, but also it's like, okay, what are you, like, Bloom, you want to finish in terms of the improvement? Well, but. well yeah, I mean, I, I, I know the concerns with Halliburton, like the, the you know, lack of, you know, literal like literal drive to the hoop and stuff and the pull-up game and the awkward jumper but I was pretty surprised like I taking a look at his stats again just looking at his stats like I was surprised to see he went from like eight points per 40 minutes as a freshman to like 16 or so this year and also like I know you've been posting yourself like the videos of like him working on these weaknesses in the draft do you see like do you see I mean those are the main concerns with you know do you see those main concerns of like off the dribble shooting and like driving hoop as something that could be built upon? I mean, the normally yes, but because his shot is so weird, yeah. that it's, it's just like hard to picture him getting that shot off. And it's the same thing was we asked about Lonzo Ball. Like, can he with those weird mechanics? Like, can you can you dribble, take a couple dribbles inside the arc, and have the time to get that shot off when it's coming from such a strange point? 
And so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he's going to be able to get it off. But um, again, it, will it matter if he's in a really good fit where he could just play to his strengths as a ball mover, as an open shot maker, um, and, and a setup man? And he, he's one of those guys, and I've used the Lonzo Ball comparison all the time. Like, he doesn't have to score 20 a game to impact that game and, and to make make the game easier for the other guys around him. So I think that's really his selling point. I think you have to draft him expecting that he's never going to average more than you know 15 points a game in his life. All right. So now one more little question, then we can let you go. So um, this is a, this is the per 36 podcast. So we normally, so we, we like focusing on, you know, the lesser known guys. I don't know if we've really had any we, today. Well, I guess. Oh, well, well maybe, maybe there was, who, who, do, who do we have? Was there per 36? Just to clarify, we're, we're kind of looking for if you had maybe a per 36-minute all-star of the draft, maybe a guy who's looked to go, maybe even a guy outside of your top 50 who you really like as just someone well, that's sticking to Well, it needs to be a draft. Like, we, you know, we, we like, to be frank, we like scrubs, like Chris Copeland, you know, <laughs> Pablo Prigioni. Yep. And so, I mean, it doesn't have to be draft teams. It could be NBA or whatever. Any yeah, call. But, yeah. but also, as a Knicks, you could do one of each. You could do one as a Knicks fan, like your favorite Knicks um, bench player of all time, and then maybe uh, uh, a sleeper in this draft who you like in the back end. Uh, completely up to you. All right, I'll go like my like my sleeper is Skylar Mays from LSU. I okay. I was had we had I was I was gonna say I wanted to bring up Skylar Mays because you you have him the highest I've ever seen um, anyone on. And having watched so much LSU basketball play against Kentucky, he he is so overlooked as just like a smart player with great footwork. Um, and he's tough. I w- I'm really happy that you you like Sky May so much. You, you you think it's really fit dependent, or you think he's just a, a baller? Like, I think he's a good player who gets overlooked because he's got like weird posture and a weird, weird, weird kind of form. It's not a fluid shot. It's like a. But I love that. Yeah, he's got a funky shot, and he's got you know he's he's but he's just like so his footwork. He he comes up with these moves to get a shot off, and he's also. Like if he's not playing basketball, if he was going to play basketball, he's going to be a doctor. Like he's brilliant, and he's and he's just a. He reminds me of Malcolm Brogdon, at least in terms of the strengths and weaknesses coming out of college. Like the reasons why I question Brogdon, like I'm like I don't want to get burned again with with Mays, and so um, I'm I'm betting on Mays. I just he's one of those guys who I would take in the first round, and and I don't think anybody I've no. talked to has a first round. No, that's what I'm. That's I so I I'm definitely. I've not seen people having that high and he's someone who like it's it's he's such an easy person to project like weaknesses on being kind of a chronic issue but he's also just such a solid smart player that it's so you don't like I wouldn't want to be the person betting against like yeah. um and then do you have do you have anyone as a as a quieted uh maybe secret Knicks fan anyone over the years that's like okay like I have a special place in my heart for him I mean, anybody who knows me knows that my favorite basketball player of all time is Latrell Sprewell. I mean, it's not like a shady guy or anything. No. Um, you know, like, go, like growing up in New York, like the weird guy, like a weird guy I liked was like LeVar Postel, who was, if you remember him, St. John's, like a total bust. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you, no idea. Um, let me think. I mean, like, you know, I, I grew up in the, the Starks, Ewing, Mason, Oakley era. Um, you know, Derek Harper was always like one of my favorite point guards growing up. Um, no, that, uh, and do you have, do you on, in terms of like a the current Knicks team? Are you a are you a Frank guy in terms of like? He's not a Frank guy. You know, I'm not. A, I'm not. A, listen, no. I, I, I'm. I like Frank because one of the first events I I went to a basketball without borders camp when Frank was like 16 years old or whatever. And he was the best player at the camp with Don Maker and with. DeAndre Ayton and they talked to him afterwards and he was so shy and so like humble and I was like oh I'm just rooting for this kid and then the Knicks drafted him and I mean obviously we know what's happened in the past couple of years and I think Frank has a good shot in the league I just don't think it's with the Knicks. That's, so that's the thing I mean I think we've all accepted that as Knicks fans now he's gonna go he's gonna succeed as a smart player on his second contract in another team and we're just gonna have to, I'm, we're gonna have to take I'm waiting I'm waiting for that like annoying trade of Frank for like someone I was talking about, you know, like maybe like Blake Griffin, you know, something like I'm kind of rooting for it at this point. Like something to just like get me to like be yeah, done with right. the Knicks and get to like root for like my young yeah, Knicks on Russell. another team. 
we give like, it. I would love, I would love for like a mink, a Frank Mitch trade to like another team. So it's like, like view okay. the Knicks solely as a meme, but root for my Knicks, you know? Yeah. No, I picture Frank like in San Antonio <laughs> making yeah, a corner yeah. three to like win a game six. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, like, like, and like picking up Trey Young at half court. Uh, the 2028 yeah frank frank has been like a spur since like the second the knicks like called his name the, the draft. Like, i would say the last question i have is just um because i i want to hear this before we go did you if you go back to the 2017 draft or 2018 draft were you medium on Knox? what was your kind of thing on on the guy so i i underst i i think i i was doing like a live show with like Howard Beck and I gave I gave him like a B plus grade which kind of indicated like that was our last podcast guest yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that was the best um Mm -hmm. and I I under I was like okay it's a gamble it's a it's a a fun gamble he's got that upside but I didn't really like him the whole year I mean I think I had him at number 11 but like like a a non-confident number 11 yeah that's that's yeah he wouldn't have been the guy I, I wanted to. I, I, Mikael Bridges was the guy that I wanted. We all, to be. We all wanted Mikael Bridges. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think. I think that was like literally me and like came as everyone's like everyone wanted like one of the Bridges, preferably the Mikael, and then everyone's like, oh, right, you know, Knox is like a forward that's not the worst player in NBA history. But then yeah, I was like, if, <laughs> they take a, if they take a gamble, I was like, Knox or Porter. Um, but of I course, Knox, I wanted Knox over Porter just because I was like, okay. If if Porter's a Nick, we just know he'll he'll have like a degenerative back problem. Like, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you remember that that draft night, like when he walked up the steps and everyone was like, "Oh my God, he can't walk." <laughs> but but hey, I, that's... I, was, I was in the studio at that time. I couldn't watch the draft. I would just get in my ear of like who the Knicks were picking <laughs> and who teams were picking. But I was like, "Oh shit, uh, Porter's still on the board though." And then but Porter but, Porter is oh, like a good example of what you're talking about, well, like you know, not see. looking looking past I, injury history. Same thing with Bull Bull. Like Bull Bull. Like I think they were all everyone's nervous about Bull Bull. Watch what Bull Bull does over the next couple of years. Wouldn't you say, I mean, Denver, I guess, is the a team that follows your your advice because I mean there has think about the level of overthinking that has to come with taking Jerome Robinson over over <laughs> Right. That's exactly and like that article I wrote, like of guys who like suddenly skyrocket like the last week of the season after playing three years of college basketball. Like Jerome Robinson is that guy. And I fall for him sometimes too. Yeah. But um, no, but I, yeah, yeah, Robinson was. Oof, yeah, the, that was a bad day. Yeah, the Nuggets literally just don't. They, they pretend injuries don't exist, and it's mm-hmm. it's kind of benefited them. Like they pick up they the Porter and Bobo. They buy low and they pick up the scraps, yeah. and like they'll probably take Cole Anthony this year, and he'll be like Jamal Murray two point oh. Oh my god, Cole Anthony next to Jokic, so like I could very much buy into that. Like that's kind of like the perfect role for him. I'd say, like and letting Nick, Jokic be the point guard. That's perfect because Cole Anthony goes to the Nuggets, then the Knicks get Monte Morris, and everyone's happy. And then, <laughs> then Cole Anthony's the best C Anthony to ever play for the Nuggets. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this game, this game. Well, All thank right. you so much for coming on today. I mean, this was this was amazing. Um, Hope, hope to talk to you again down the future. Um, thank you so much. This was yep. great. Do you have anything specific to promote or anything? Um, I have a rumors and draft buzz piece coming out Wednesday, but I'm still collecting some information. But uh, I think that's that's the only thing other than the top 50 big board that was out today. Okay. Which well, is pretty, pretty good. Um, um, all right. Awesome. Thank you so All much. Right, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great night. All right. Thanks, fellas.